Right, well, I think we'll get started then. So, as I said, I've, I'm going to record this, so it will go onto YouTube as a slide cast, and you can, I'll send you the URL for that later, to, hopefully later today, I should get it up today. I've sent all of you a handout as well this morning, and some papers. Um, so, my name's Mark Pallon, I'm a microbiologist, I work actually down in the School of Biosciences, although I used to be in the medical school, I am a medic by training. And... Uh, my particular interest is in microbial genomics, in, in bacterial genome sequences. And what I'm hoping to show you here is how we can use these kind of approaches to shed light on uh, historical events. Contemporary events as well, but also historical events. And so I've put it kind of back to front there. We're going from the modern back to the medieval. Now, I didn't know when I was uh, preparing this how much depth to go into, whether to go for a very broad overview of everything, but quite superficial or whether to just look at one subject or one paper in depth. I've tried to find the middle ground, and I hope I'm going to succeed. What I'm not going to be able to do is to go into a lot of the technicalities of how these studies were actually completed. I'll just skate over the conclusions, if you like. But um, I have, as I say, I've sent you all the papers, so you can, if you want to work through those and, and uh, find out in more detail, you can do so. So this is what I'm going to cover, just briefly uh, introduce infection and history, three kind of approaches that we can use uh, and take you through how we might use those. So genomic epidemiology, looking at pathogen evolution, and then finishing up with paleogenomics. I probably don't have to say this, but just I will anyway. I mean, infection is obviously very important in history. It's still a major cause of death and misery across the world. It's still a kind of major existential threat to humankind in a way. And it's still in the news all the time with all these public anxieties and hospital infection. But if we look back in history, I mean, it has had a decisive effect. Now, you can take two views of history. History is made by great men and great women, or it's made by movements that would have happened whether those individuals are there or not. Here, here are a couple of what we might call great men that changed the course of history. Anyone recognise who they are? This is Oliver Cromwell. And this one here? Muhammad Ali Jinnah, founder of Pakistan. Cromwell died of malaria um, prematurely, you know, at a fairly young age. He could have actually been saved because at the, in his time, quinine had been brought over by missionaries, Catholic missionaries from South America, but he refused to take it because he was a staunch Protestant and he wouldn't take this papist powder. So he died of malaria, he died of bigotry. But it's interesting to speculate what would have happened if he'd have lived a little bit longer and put in place a proper succession plan. Uh, after his death, the, 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 the Commonwealth fell to pieces and uh, we had the monarchy come back again. Uh, you know, maybe we'd have been a, a, one of the first countries in Europe to actually become a proper republic if we'd have lived a little bit longer and stayed around. Muhammad Ali Jinnah similarly died of tuberculosis uh, around a year after the birth of Pakistan. Pakistan had, a, I think, a fairly stormy course uh, in terms of kind of nation building after his death. And it's interesting to contrast him with, say, Nelson Mandela, who also had tuberculosis. Uh, but lived at a time when we could cure tuberculosis. And uh, as you know in history, Mandela actually did see uh, South Africa through to a, a peaceful transition to a, a stable uh, multiracial go government. In terms of the great sweeps of history, uh, you've already heard about plague, and we're going to say a lot more about that, all these skeletons dancing in medieval times, uh, illustrating the the clear present nature of death for people in those days. Uh, why Europeans found all over the world? Why did Europeans colonize America, North America, South America, Australia, and so, so forth? Uh, the answer is nothing to do with racial superiority or anything like that. Uh, as Jared Diamond says in this very readable book here, it's all down to guns, germs, and steel. And germs in particular played a decisive role here. The, the infections that Europeans brought into the New World decimated the populations there, uh, which had no immunity to things like smallpox and measles, um, and this uh, uh, basically um, cleared the way, if you like, for European colonisation. 
Now, you might think this is all in the past, but I'll just show you a quick trailer. I don't know if anyone's seen this film, but just to remind you uh, that it's still a clear and present danger. It's a groundbreaking ceremony for a new factory. Did she mention seeing anyone who was sick? Anyone on a plane at the airport? No, she said she was jet lagged. Anyone seen the film already? The average person touches their face three to five times every waking minute. In between, we're touching doorknobs, water fountains, and each other. Beth! No, 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 uh, uh, go up to your room, honey. So we have a virus with no treatment protocol and no vaccine at this time. You had a seizure this morning, Beth. Did she have a history of seizures? No, no, no. Allergies? No. As of last night, there were 32 cases. Unfortunately, she did die. Right. Lisa, can I go talk to her? Mr. Amos, your wife is dead. What are you talking about? Okay. What happened to her? What happened to her? Is there any way someone could weaponize the bird flu? Is that what we're looking at? Someone doesn't have to weaponize the bird flu. The birds are doing that. Watch this. It's transmission. So we just need to know which direction. On day one, there were two people, and then four, and then 16. In three months, it's a billion. That's where we're headed. They're calling out the National Guard. They're moving the president underground. People will panic. Get away! It will tip over. The truth is being kept from the world. Cook your samples. Destroy everything. So that's the film Contagion, which... Uh... I think it must be any time oh. now, isn't it, coming out on DVD, coming out last September in the cinemas. It's an emergency. And uh, I think it makes a powerful case that this is still at risk. I got people too. Uh, we I have had uh, outbreaks like this in, the, in recent Don't times. Don't talk to anyone. In, in, in Don't talk to anyone. Well. Stay away from other people. The business in this house. We're not sick. It's me, Tiger. You better get on. So, let's go to something a bit more uh, kind of mundane or arcane, even. Uh, and so, my story begins in terms of how we use sequences in all this with this paper that appeared in 1965. This is a pioneering paper from Emil Zuckerkandl and Linus Pauling. Pauling was one of the few people that got two Nobel Prizes. And he was one of the first, well, what the first person to realise that you could look at the sequences of DNA and protein and actually use those sequences to reconstruct historical events. So the branching patterns in evolution and so forth. Uh, what he called molecular phylogeny. Shortly after that, this guy, Moto Kimura, pointed out that actually at the molecular level, what we see most of the time are actually neutral mutations. Lots of mutations going on all the time that have no effect whatsoever on the biology of the organism. And as far as natural selection is concerned, they're just noise. But they're actually useful because they, those changes have been accumulated in a kind of clock-like fashion. And if we scoop them all up and analyze them properly, we can actually reconstruct phylog phylogenies, if you like family trees of molecules and of the organisms that, that uh, they come from. So here's an example of how you might do this. This is taken from human chimps, gorillas and orangutans, but you can do the same with bacteria. If you take a stretch of sequence, you can align it, uh, and you can see that in most situations, most positions here, it's the same sequence in each of these four organisms. But every now and then, there is what we might call an informative or polymorphic site where there are differences. So here we can see that there are three A's here for human chimp and gorilla. The orangutan has a C there, so that suggests that the orangutan is an outgroup there. And in fact, if you take all of these this data together, you can construct a tree like this. Uh, um, again, can't go into the details of how you do that. There are various methods you can do, use. But um, in the end, you end up with a tree that reconstructs the branching patterns and to some degree also the branch lengths uh, in terms of the evolution of the organisms in front of you. Now when we apply this to bacteria, we do have some problems. In many bacteria, bacteria 
always engaged in kind of group sex, if you like. They're always exchanging genes with each other. Uh, and that makes it rather messy. So for things like Neisseria, we get rather messy kind of pictures when we look at this. But there are some lineages, what we might call clonal lineages in bacteria, that show a nice tidy branching evolution. And to create these uh, phylogenies, we, we look mainly at single nucleotide polymorphisms. So where one character in the DNA changes into another, an A turns into a T or into a C or a G or whatever. And uh, we make an assumption, a kind of... It's an assumption that you can question, but we make an assumption that the accumulation of those mutations is going on at a steady rate, and therefore it shows a kind of clock-like behaviour. Now, it's worth... Uh, I have to skate over so much here, but it, uh, in terms of bacteria, for 10, 10, 15, maybe 20 years, we've been able to look at gene sequences and reconstruct phylogenies. But in the last few years, uh, we've actually now been able to look at whole genomes of bacteria, and that's thanks to some breakthroughs in technology, the advent of what we call high-throughput sequencing. A variety of platforms that allow us to sequence bacterial genomes now in, in, in a few days uh, for a few hundreds of pounds. And um, this has really allowed us to put the, a foot on the accelerator and really move fast forward here. So in the last couple of years, we've seen a, a whole crop of papers telling us about how you can reconstruct the phylogeny of outbreaks, uh, contemporary outbreaks, ongoing outbreaks, or outbreaks that have spanned the last few years using these kind of approaches. And here's just some screen dumps of a few papers on this. Um, I've, actually, I've actually made my own contribution here. Last summer we were involved in the German E. coli outbreak, and we actually did sequencing of the German E. coli that decimated Germany, affected more than 3,000 people, have killed more than 50 people. Um, another high-profile uh, case here is is so-called Emerythrax case, where there was deliberate contamination of the U.S. postal system with a with an anthrax uh, bacillus, and that has been picked apart using genome analysis and other techniques, and uh, they've been able to identify. The, well, first of all, that it was a common lab strain uh, that came from America rather than from Saddam Hussein or somewhere in the Middle East. And, and they also more recently have been able to actually point the finger at one particular individual based on these kind of analyses. Okay, so that's a kind of general introduction. Let's look at a few case studies. So I know that you've had a lecture on cholera. Just to remind you of the bacteriology of cholera, it's caused by an organism called Vibrio cholerae, which is a curved gram-negative rod. You can see an electron microscope, um, a micrograph of it here. And uh, there's this serial group O1, uh, which is, accounts for human cholera, the infection that we have. Um, and that's divided, has been classically at least, divided into two so-called biotypes on the basis of biochemical reactions you can do in the lab, so-called classical Vibrio cholera O1, um, and uh, a variety called El Tor. Also in the last uh, 10, 15, well, 15 years or so, uh, 20 years even, uh, there's been this Bengal O137 serogroup described as well as part of an ongoing cholera spreading throughout the world. Cholera is transmitted by contaminated food, but more particularly by contaminated water. And it's where Basically, human sewage gets into the human water supply uh, that you get uh, explosive growth of cholera. What are the features? Well, you get this profuse watery diarrhoea. The stools that you get are so uh, described as rice water. Like uh, if you boil up some rice, uh, the water that's left behind kind of slightly opaque uh, sort of uh, feature there, that, 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 that is what you see. It is extremely watery, and these individuals can produce up to 10 to 20 litres of diarrhoea per day. So this is a cholera ward uh, in a Bangladesh hospital, and you can see quite how simple and crude the treatment is. You have a bed, you have a plastic sheet put over the bed, you make a hole in that sheet and you put a bucket underneath, and you align the person's backside with that hole so that they can just lie there and pass all that diarrhoea into the bucket, which you can take away and empty at regular intervals. 
without intravenous fluids, you know, the mortality is, is, is uh, extremely high. Uh, you just cannot keep up with the loss of fluids by uh, using oral hydration alone. Now, cholera seems to have been around for a long time in ancient India and China. Kind of modern history begins in 1817 when the first so-called pandemic started in India. And since then, there have been seven cholera pandemics recognised. You recognise what this is here? We've been told about John Snow. So actually, if you next time you go to London, there is actually still a pump there. It's not the original pump, but they put this pump up uh, as a memorial to John Snow's pioneering efforts in actually tying down the, the cause of cholera to that contaminated water coming through that pump. And you'll note that they've rebuilt the pump and left the handle off as well in tribute to John Snow. Now, what you might not realise, if you look in the distance there, there's a pub. A pub is called the John Snow Pub. And there's a John Snow Society. And the, and the sole uh, thing you have to do as a member of that society is whenever you go to London, you have to have a pint in that pub, or at least a drink in that pub, the John Snow Pub. Anyway, let's get on. So we've got um, bacterial ice that's only really available from the 6th and 7th pandemic. So what went on in the early 19th century, we don't actually have the John Snow cholera uh, isolate, unfortunately. But what does genome, genome sequencing tell us? Well, this is a, a recent review that summarises the kind of big picture. So when we look at the genomes of uh, Vibrio cholerae and the related organisms, we see Vibrio cholerae out here as a little cluster of, uh, of strains, uh, and we can see it's related to these other. So Vibrio mimicus is closely related. It's so called cool because it mimics cholera. There are two in blue here. These are environmental ice that's actually now been given separate species name, names. And then there are some other Vibrios that also cause disease, but not really cholera-like disease in humans. And so we can kind of get this big picture view of how cholera fits in this big picture. If we look down in cholera itself, Vibrio cholerae, we can actually see that the seventh pandemic strains, you can just about see there, are all clustered together. They're all very tightly related to one another, which is kind of what you'd expect, if you like, for uh, a pandemic that's had recent origin. Um, and we can see, if we look further, sort of zoom out further, we can see that they sit uh, within a cluster that includes all these other El Tor uh, isolates, and then you can see how the classical isolates that come from the sixth pandemic relate to them. Now, in terms of that seventh pandemic, if we want to look in more detail, um, there's a paper published last year in Nature, I think it was last year, or maybe even early this year, um, from a group from the, mainly led from the Sanger, from my old PhD supervisor, Gordon Dugan, who got his FRS a couple of weeks ago, so he's a very happy man. But this study that they did at the Sanger they took cholera isolate, Vibrio cholera isolates from all around the world um, and they did a molecular phylogeny of them. So as it says here, the first six cholera pandemics caused by the classical biotype, but L Tor subsequently spread globally and replaced the classical biotype in the current pandemic. Now one of the problems when you're trying to reconstruct the, ev the evolution of cholera uh, or any bacterium that, uh, that behaves in a similar way is that there's lots of what we call horizontal gene transfer going on. So there are lots of bits of DNA, chunks of DNA, what we often call them pathogenicity islands, that are popping into the genome, and sometimes popping out again, uh, within a particular lineage. So one example here is that this, this L-Tor, uh, so o o O1 serogroup, uh, actually uh, it, it contains, within, within in terms of that clade, that, that branch of the family of, of cholera, it actually contains the O139. So O13, when we do uh, we look at cholera in the lab, uh, using traditional approaches, we, we place a lot of emphasis on the serotype of, the, of this, of, of the strain in front of us. But in fact, what happened is that you've got these two, you've got a new locus has come in and just replaced the old one. But in fact, the rest of the genome is pretty much the same. So what they did here was that they, they ignored all that stuff that was moving around and it was changing in big, in, in, in sort of large-scale changes. And they just looked at uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms in conserved genes. Uh, and they looked at 154 genome sequences, which is a, you know, an astonishing number con considering that you know, it was only 
15 years ago, we had our first bacterial genome sequence. And what they showed here was that actually uh, this uh, current pandemic originated in the Bay of Bengal, but spread around the world in three independent but overlapping waves. So it wasn't it came out of the Bay of Bengal once and then moved. It actually has come out these three times. Um, the early spread there, this wave one, traveling into Africa, into South America, into Europe, a second wave where there was spread also into Africa, but also into Southeast Asia, and then this third wave, uh, again, spreading uh, into the Caribbean, into Asia, and into Africa. So this has given us a you know, very fine-grained view of how cholera has been spreading around the world. Now, you may be aware that actually cholera has been a big problem in Haiti in the last couple of years. Um, after the earthquake, uh, cholera came. And um, it's also been a problem elsewhere in, in Zimbabwe as well. But uh, a particular newsworthy item uh, was that when this outbreak was ongoing, this uh, approach of high throughput sequencing was applied to two of the isolates from that outbreak. And in fact, it was a, a new version of high throughput sequencing or, or next generation sequencing known as PAC Bio or Pacific Bio Biosciences Sequencing. Uh, and they sequenced a couple of isolates in less than 24 hours. And what they showed was that, indeed, the epidemic in, in Haiti was clonal. They they very, very similar, the two isolates. It belonged to the LTOR biovar of O1, which was kind of expected as well. But the most controversial thing they concluded was it actually arrived in Haiti through human activity, and in particular, it belonged to a South Asian clone of Vibrio cholerae, um, which they posited had been introduced into Haiti by Nepalese peacekeepers that had come in as UN peacekeepers after the earthquake. So you can see that this is actually, in political terms, is quite an incendiary kind of conclusion, and the people of Haiti were not too pleased to discover that the peacekeepers had actually brought this to them. Uh, this initial finding, in fact, they were kind of you know, sticking their neck out a bit because it wasn't absolute. They, they could say it was an Asian variety, but they couldn't say it was Nepalese. Subsequent studies have really now nailed that down con conclusively, and it was Nepalese peacekeepers that brought cholera to Haiti. Okay, that's a, a quick look at cholera. I'm going to take you through another case study now, looking at leprosy. So I know you've had some stuff on cholera, but you've probably not had anything on leprosy up to now. So leprosy is a chronic infectious disease of the skin, and the peripheral nerves caused by uh, a bacterium, Mycobacterium leprae. And it was discovered by this guy here, Armour Hansen, um, back in 1873. And in fact, it, it's in the record books, because this was the first bacterium that was actually identified as causing a disease in humans. It's, uh, it, it, it's in the record books for other reasons as well. It, it's, uh, it, you cannot grow this organism, so it's remarkable it was the first one to be tied to human disease. Uh, you, you, we've never been able to grow it in the laboratory uh, since then. Sometimes people call leprosy Hansen's disease in honour of, of Armour Hansen, also because the, the word leprosy sometimes has a stigma, although you know, leprosy is still very commonly used as the name. What you get here in this disease is you get the peripheral anaesthesia, and this leads to this kind of chronic course of disfigurement, incurable disfigurement and physical disabilities, and this culminates in rejection and exclusion from society. So it's not the disease itself that destroys your fingers, let's say. It's the fact that you have no sensation in your fingers and, you know, you trap your fingers in a door or you cut yourself or whatever and you don't know you've done that and then you get infections and you slowly start to lose things. So here's some pretty horrific images. This is, to show you, the first one here is a Norwegian sufferer from leprosy. So leprosy was only eradicated in, in Europe around the turn of the 19th to 20th century. Um, it's still common in parts of the world, although in my working lifetime, I'm pleased to say there's been tremendous progress in actually controlling and moving towards eradication of disease. But this is a, um, a lady from the Indian subcontinent here. You can see with the classical features of what we call the prometus leprosy. She's lost the digits on her hands there. They've been damaged uh, and she's not noticed and they've slowly been lost. She's, going, she's probably gone blind because that's another effect of the infection as well. Um, in fact, 
just as a sort of side issue, there's a there's an interesting series of fantasy novels called the uh, first one of these called Lord Fowl's Bane, where the uh, hero it's a bit kind of like Lord of the Rings, but the hero is a patient who has leprosy, who goes into this uh, um, imaginary world, and so kind of it's written by someone whose father was actually a, a looked after leprosy patients. Key point is leprosy is curable, and this is an example here of someone who had leprosy and then was given treatment. And you can see that if you catch it in the early stages, you can actually reverse the, uh, the terrible damage that it can do. So in terms of uh, our understanding of leprosy, we, we kind of moved into the genomic age quite early on. In, in, uh, I don't know if this was 2000 or 2001, around that time, uh, the first genome sequence of Mycobacterium leprae was obtained. Now, in many ways, this is a tour de force, because as I said, you can't grow this in the lab. The only organism, there's only two organisms you can grow it in. You can grow it in mice, in nude mice that have no immune systems, or you can grow it in the nine-banded armadillo, which is a, you know, it's a pub quiz fact that's worth remembering. The only other organism it grows in is a nine-banded armadillo. Um, and that's what they did. They basically grew it up in an armadillo, chucked the armadillo into a blender, and then harvested the, the leprosy bacillus in sufficient amounts to actually get a genome sequence. And what they found was something rather strange, actually. Uh, I'm getting a little bit off the genomic epidemiology, but they found that actually uh, the genome contained lots and lots of broken genes. In fact, it says less than half the genome contains functional genes. Uh, and instead, it has what we call lots and lots of pseudogenes. So these are things that look like genes, but they have, say, a frame shift or a stop code on or some other uh, mutation that actually stops them making a functional uh, protein. Uh, and this is uh, thought to be because Mycobacterium leprae has moved into a very specific niche in humans. So its ancestor probably lived in a, a much more varied environment, perhaps in the soil, and had to count all sorts of things, extremes of temperature and, and all sorts of stuff. It now just lives in humans, um, and uh, it's, it's basically in the process of throwing away much of its genome. Now, in terms of uh, trying to track the spread of uh, leprosy is actually again a very difficult problem because um, there are very few changes. This is an organism that grows very very slowly and there are very very few changes. In fact I met Stuart Cole, lead author on this, uh, uh, I think about a year before this paper came out and he was explaining how hard it was to actually find any informative polymorphisms among the isolates that they had from around the world. But uh, they managed to get some uh, information together, they, and they uh, came up with this paper um, where they said it's basically a single clone disseminated worldwide, a very rare single nucleotide polymorphisms, and it seems to have originated in East Africa or, or the Near East and spread with successive human migrations. Um, so uh, you're probably aware that modern humans are now, all the modern humans out of Africa are thought to have originated in Africa in relatively recent times, 70,000, 80,000 years ago. And it's thought that perhaps leprosy came out of Africa with that wave. But it also spread through uh, in, in, from Europeans and North Africans into West Africa and into the Americas relatively recently uh, through these recent migrations. So this is their kind of map of, of how, using these four different SNP types that they discovered, of how it spread. So. Migrations within Asia, out of Africa, migrations into Europe, but also the, the slave trade carried it into um, the Americas, particularly with these SNP types that were found in Europe and North Africa, predominating in North and South America. And also the, the um, colon well, sorry, so I'm getting confused. colonialism accounts for the, 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 this um, purple SNP type moving into the Americas. In the Caribbean, you can see that there was this West African SNP type that also moved probably due to the slave trade. They've had a more recent paper out now where they've actually uh, done whole genome sequencing of uh, several uh, strains. So the previous paper was what they did there was they looked at, at various sites and tried to find polymorphism. They didn't get the whole genome out. Now they get the whole genome out um, and they sequence strains from Thailand and from uh, the United States as well, um, and they compared that to a strain from India, and then they looked at these polymorphic sites elsewhere. 
Now, one particularly fascinating thing that they did was that they actually didn't just stop at looking at current isolates from the, or contemporary isolates from patients, but they also looked at ancient DNA. So leprosy is one of, the, one of those diseases which actually does leave lesions on the bone that can be recognised in, 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 in uh, fossils, or, or at least uh, uh, ancient human remains. Um, and so what they, would, what they were able to do is they, they could collect together skeletal remains that showed clear osteological evidence of lepromatous leprosy, the, the most severe and disseminated form of leprosy, and they were able to amplify up, using PCR, sequences from the, from the leprosy bacillus in those uh, um, bony samples. And as it says here, all 13 cases, these ancient DNA samples are found to belong to SNP type 3, and of those, seven were successfully subtyped. So they managed to get from uh, a variety, in fact, I've got on the next slide here, this shows you they were able to look at samples from around Europe and, and the Middle East. They were able to look at individuals at various times of death, looked at rhino and maxillary palatine samples, maxillary palatine tibia, foot bones, nasal region skull, nasal region. But you can see that they... The samples go back uh, over a millennium. In fact, the earliest one's going back to the 7th century uh, of the current era. And um, in fact, there are some examples, not in this study, there are some examples of obtaining DNA from uh, Egyptian mummies as well. Oh, here it is, yeah, Egyptian one there. It is the one in this study as well. So the 4th to 5th century, uh, a mummy there. So they were able to subtype those. So they're able to bring in these ancient DNA samples into their framework. Um, and, I mean, basically this, the, the, the takeaway message was more or less the same as in their previous study, but they added a lot more finesse to it, a lot more detail to their study. And they also were able to come, they, they, they suggested also that the Silk Road in the first century, the trade between Europe um, and, and, and China, going through Central Asia was actually uh, probably involved in the spread of leprosy uh, during the, that time. Right, the third example I'm going to look at now in the last 20-25 uh, minutes or so is Yersinia pestis. So you've had a lecture on plague. Uh, Yersinia pestis causes plague. There's a mammalian reservoir, so there are animals out there, rats, but other rodents that carry plague. Um, and it is maintained within those animal populations in what we call an enzootic uh, uh, existence. And it also can cause what we call epizoosis, where it can actually spread uh, quite dramatically through those uh, organisms as well. It's transmitted by fleas. And it's not just like passively carried by the fleas. There appears to be within the plague bacillus uh, specific adaptations which help it be, to be spread. So there's this HMS uh, gene product which makes the bacteria form aggregates in the flea, in the foregut of the flea. So the flea, uh, the, the gastrointestinal tract of the flea gets blocked and when the, f the flea starts to feed a second time, it regurgitates the, the material that it took up from a previous host. So in effect, it's actually inoculating the blood from the previous host into the next host. And this is obviously helping transmission dramatically. There's also a particular locus that's needed to survive in the flea uh, on one of the plasmids. Now in humans, it causes systemic infections, gets into the bloodstream and travels around, and there are various virulence factors that allow it to do that. And I've sent you, a, there's a, a quite a nice re review from a friend of mine, Brendan Wren, uh, on um, Yersinia, the, the genus, and particularly how pestis became a pathogen. Just to put that in uh, more diagrammatic terms, we have the flea here, um, and then this bites, gets into the bloodstream, gets into the lymph nodes, into the lymph, lymphatics, into the lymph nodes, and 
Then in the, in the regional lymph nodes, it causes what we call bubonic plague. Those lymph nodes swell up, they may ulcerate, um, and that these lesions that you see are often known as bubos, and that's where the term bubonic plague comes from. Gets into the blood, and you get this septicemia, and then uh, start colonizing other organs, gets into the spleen, the liver, but particularly troublesome is it gets into the lungs, and then the individual starts to cough up uh, large amounts of aerosolized Yersinia pestis, and this is what we call pneumonic plague. So pneumonic plague, bubonic plague is not transmissible from one individual to another. You have to go through the flea uh, and the rats as well to be involved. But pneumonic plague is transmissible, highly transmissible from one individual to another. Now the interesting point is that this is what goes on with plague, but in fact the other, there are two other species of pathogenic Yersinia that are pathogenic to humans, and those are much more sedate in, in their pathology. They are transmitted through uh, the, the oral route, and they infect the gastrointestinal tract, and they tend to cause just localised infection, mesenteric adenitis and so forth in the gut, a bit of gastroenteritis, and only very rarely do they actually get into the bloodstream and cause systemic infection. So just to remind you about the Black Death, you've had a lecture on, mentioned the Black Death. Uh, this spread across Europe in the 14th century. Here some uh, a picture showing people with the bubos and the bubonic plague. The, these medieval images of, of, of you know, death dancing around, kind of ever-present. Uh, political upheaval and demographic changes. I mean, the decimation of populations was... Uh, had dramatic social changes as a peasant's revolt that was triggered by plague in, in England. Um, in fact, uh, you know, that there was a continual rise in population numbers and in the kind of standard of living and health of the population until the plague, and then suddenly there was a, a drop-off which lasted for several centuries in terms of the standard of living. Now, you might think that top picture is a bit fanciful. This bottom picture here shows a plague pit, so at those times during the Black Death, there wasn't time to have proper burials for people. They just uh, dug pits in the ground and chucked the, the dead bodies in. And you can just you get a, a feel for the, the horror of, of the Black Death when you look at the way these, these skeletons are just being thrown in higgledy-piggledy. But these plague pits have actually proved an invaluable source of information about the cause of the Black Death. Now, there are... Uh, lots of individuals who have questioned over time whether the Black Death was really caused by Yersinia pestis. It's a bit like, you know, all these people that question whether Shakespeare actually wrote Shakespeare's plays. There are those contrarian individuals who want to say, mm, there are these features that suggest it really wasn't Yersinia pestis, it's not the same as what we call plague and all that now. Um, and if you go over the historical records, I guess, you know, you're not going to get a definitive answer to that because there were no pathologist who would have taken tissue sections or no microbiologist would have grown it back then. So how do we move forward? Well, let's, if we're looking at what genomics and genome analysis and sequence analysis can tell us about Yersinia pestis. The first message that we got um, over 10 years ago now was actually, when we look at Yersinia pestis around the world, it's a bit like leprosy. It's very, very... Clonal. There isn't much variation within uh, the, among the isolates that we get from various sites around the world. And in fact, if you look at Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, you find that that's much more variable as a species in terms of if you look at individual genes and how much they vary. And Yersinia pestis is actually nested within the variation you see within Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. So if we were looking at genomes alone and using just sequence comparisons, we would actually have to say that Yersinia pestis isn't really a species on its own right. It's just a variety of Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, but a particular, uh, particularly pathogenic variety, particularly distinctive variety. So, in fact, in taxonomic terms, nobody so far has suggested we throw out the term Yersinia pestis. Now, the bacteriologists in the, in the last half century or so have distinguished what they call three biovars of Yersinia pestis, so called Antiqua, Medievalis, and Orientalis. And, and these appear to form distinct kind of clays, different branches on the phylogenetic trees. And in this paper here, 
they said, uh, they said that what they saw was consistent with an idea that had been suggested, I think, in the 50s, which was that um, Antiqua, the Antiqua Biovar calls the very first plague pandemic, the so-called Justinian plague in the 6th century. Medievalis calls the Black Death um, and, and that second pandemic way. And then Orientalis calls the current plague pandemic, which arose towards the end of the 19th century. Some of you may have heard the, the term just so stories, which is often applied in evolutionary biology for stories that seem rather trite and kind of superficially plausible, but you know, nobody questions the underlying assumptions. Um, and uh, you know, one, even at this stage, you could sort of think, well, is that really a just so story, or has they really got good evidence for that? How would we ever find out? Now, one of the interesting things that the genome sequencing has been able to show us is that actually how do we get from a pathogen like pseudotuberculosis, which travels through the gut, actually lives out in the external environment, in the soil, in large amounts. But when it does cause disease, we get it through uh, ingestion, uh, and, but it stays pretty much around the gut and associated lymphoid tissue. How do you get from that to this lethal pathogen, Yersinia pestis? What we find is, that if we look at the genomes, we can see that the first stage is that there are these plasmids that have been acquired by Yersinia pestis. So plasmids are circular bits of DNA separate from the chromosome. They replicate separately from the chromosome. And they often carry what we might call accessory genes that give you extra functions, kind of niche-specific functions to the bacterium. So there are these two plasmids um, which were acquired by Yersinia pestis, or PCP1, and PMT1, or PFRAS, it's sometimes known. So PCP1 contains this pla uh, encodes a, a plasminogen activator gene. And this is probably what is needed to um, survive in the bloodstream and allow dissemination of the organism through the, through the body. The other plasmid contains this capsular antigen, again, which is, has antiphagocytic activities, probably allows survival in the bloodstream as well. And a murine toxin that we mentioned earlier that needs to survive in the flea. There is a, also another virulence plasma, which is found in the ancestral Yersinias as well. So it, it was already primed to cause disease, but acquired two more plasmids, which took it further in towards being able to cause disease. Another interesting thing is, if you look around the, the chromosome of Yersinia pestis, and, well, in fact, the whole genome, you see that there are great chunks of DNA that have been swapped in, carrying clusters of genes, maybe dozens of genes in a row, that provide new um, virulence-related phenotypes. And we often call these pathogenicity islands uh, when we're talking about evolution of genomes. And you can see there's a whole range of these here. Now, not all of these have actually been tied very uh, precisely down to given virulence, fact, uh, virulence phenotypes. But in the round, it does suggest that there have been changes uh, and adaptations towards this new uh, kind of existence through the acquisition of new DNA. Another interesting feature, and we don't quite know what this means, whether it does mean anything for virulence, but it's an interesting feature similar to what we saw with Mycobacterium leprae, is we see um, gene degradation, lots of pseudogenes appearing in the gene. We also see what we call insertion sequences, or IS elements, proliferating. So these are jumping genes that can just jump around from one part of the genome to another. Now normally if one of those jumps into a gene, and destroys the gene. If the gene's useful, that's selected against. That particular lineage will die out. But where large parts of the genome are no longer necessary for the new lifestyle, so this, like M. leprae, has moved from being a generalist to being a very specific kind of pathogen, it's starting to throw away lots of its genome. And the, and the movement of those IS elements is one of the hallmarks of that going on. And another interesting thing, which we don't really understand what its significance is, is that parts of the genome are swiveling around. And in fact, they're swiveling around, even within a culture, you can see re lots of rearrangements going on. So in the middle there, this is just a circular depiction of the whole genome, then looking at various measures within the genome, pseudogenes, IS elements. But right in the middle there is, a, is something we call GC skew. And when you calculate GC skew, usually it gives you a, a fairly good idea about where the origin of replication is. And replication goes off in two directions and then joins back up again that those kind of wavefronts join up at the bottom. 
normally you see a nice symmetrical distribution of GC skew, but Yersinia pestis is a, a counterexample there where we've seen bits of the genome have actually swung around and moved from one place to another uh, and upset that arrangement. Now, we don't know whether that means anything in terms of pathogenesis, whether any of the genes involved in virulence have actually had their expression changed by movements or insertion sequences jumping into promoters and so forth, but it is an interesting observation. Um, here's just a list just to, to show you how extensive this lots sorts of uh, pseudogenes, which actually look like they're virulence genes in other Yersinias, but they are obviously no longer necessary for the virulence of Yersinia pestis. Anyway, I'm getting a bit too much into pathogenesis. Let's get back to what we can say about epidemiology and evolution and where these things come from. There have been a whole range of papers in the last 10 years about uh, Yersinia pestis and about DNA and relationship. I've just chosen a few of them here. So this was an early paper. Um, Mark Achman is the first author. Um, Paul Keim, the last. I'm seeing Paul Keim in a few weeks, actually, at a meeting in, in, um, in Washington. Uh, he's done a lot of work on plague and also on anthrax. And what they showed in this first paper um, was that there was this, you know, this known, very tight uh, genomic conservation within Yersinia pestis, but they were able to find these single nucleotide polymorphisms when they looked hard enough. And when they tried to draw phylogenies on the basis of that, they could see that there were these two big branches, what they called um, branch one and branch two there. And they uh, did kind of calculations as to when they diverged. And they came up with a figure of about five and a half thousand years. Um, and then they went back further and they came back to another branch point, uh, another 5,000 years further. Yeah. So they're talking about millennia uh, in terms of the evolution of this organism. However, they, 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 they said these populations not co correspond directly to classical biovars based on phenotypic properties. And they say it's premature to infer an association between any mo modern molecular grouping and a particular pandemic wave. So that's the first kind of example where they're saying, actually, it's not clear really what the uh, evolution was. and We shouldn't jump to these just-so stories. This is the Black Death crawling through Europe. Well, not crawling, speeding through Europe. In five years, it took out Europe 20 million people, a third of the population, maybe more died. So can we actually infer anything about the causative agent of the Black Death from these kind of molecular and genomic studies? Well, we can. Uh, and now I, I put this talk together very quickly and I sent you a handout this morning and I forgot to put this paper in the handout. I've sent you this paper subsequently. So those of you who notice there's a discrepancy between the slides I'm showing you a handout, I apologise. I just realised I had to put this paper in in terms of historical priority of who did what first. I've also left out a lot of papers where people have actually shown that... Uh, so there's this idea, this doubt about whether earlier thought, uh, versions of what we call plague were really caused by Yersinia pestis. What people did was they, they then looked for, using uh, PCR, they looked for DNA related to Yersinia pestis in uh, victims of the plague, initially going back uh, a couple of hundred years, and then going further back into the medieval period, going back to the period of the Black Death, and back even as far as the Justinian plague. There have been some controversies. A friend of mine actually tried to amplify DNA from Yersinia pestis in teeth from plague pits in London, and couldn't find any. Uh, and he was like, you know, maybe this is all contamination. But I think now that, you know, the consensus is it, it, it wasn't. Uh, he was just unlucky. There's a guy, Didier Raoul, who's done a lot of work in this area, uh, a pioneering work, particularly looking at uninterrupt, uh, unerupted um, molars. So if you think about the tooth, the tooth has got pulp in it, which is sampling your bloodstream all the time. If you suddenly die, that gets sealed off. And particularly if it's an unerupted molar in, in the jaw, it's kind of sealed off even more, so it acts as like a time capsule. And as a result, you know, people were able to show, yes, you could get your senior pestis DNA from those teeth. And that was, in itself, is a wonderful finding. It basically does confirm that the Black Death was caused by your senior pestis. And 
strongly suggest that the Justinian plague back in the 6th and 7th century was also caused by, by Yersinia pestis. But what about what kind of Yersinia pestis? Could we ever get towards a, a genome sequence of that G uh, Yersinia pestis from so, so long ago? Well, this paper came out uh, uh, in, in 2010. Um, it says here, Black Death caused uh, 40, 1347 to 53, killed tens of millions of people, but the etiology remained controversial. Um, also controversial whether it was the same disease in the north and south of Europe. And what they found was DNA and protein signatures. So they also found the capsule of Yersinia pestis, an unusual capsule among bacteria, because it's made of protein. But they were able to detect the cap capsule of protein and DNA from Yersinia pestis in these um, samples from the period of the Black Death. Um, and they looked at various nucleotide polymorphisms, and they basically showed that uh, there was uh, two clades, two varieties, very closely related, that looked to be ancestral to all of what we know today. So all the, the, if you take all of the known Yersinia pestis around the world today and you draw a family tree, what you can do is you can actually infer what the ancestor looked like. And the ancestor looked very much like what they found here from, these, from, from their uh, samples. So in fact... Uh, they took samples from several sites in Europe. In fact, one not far from here in Hereford. They took some plague uh, uh, victims from there. And this uh, arrows here show the, the possible route of plague as it spread through. Um, and this is their family tree, their phylogenetic tree that they grew, uh, that they drew. Um, they have those two branches that we saw earlier in earlier phylogenetic uh, trees based on the existing plague bacilli. But they basically were able to put, push, put their... Um, these ancient DNA uh, uh, sequences at close to the branch point. One of them actually at the branch point where these two lineages diverged. That was uh, pretty fantastic, uh, I think, as a finding. But since then, we've had something even more remarkable, which was as this group here have actually managed to capture a whole genome sequence of Yersinia pestis from the Black Death uh, period. Um, so what they did here was they reconstructed a, an ancient genome of Yersinia pestis at 30-fold coverage, which in, in terms of when we sequence genomes, that is pretty uh, impressive coverage, pretty acceptable coverage, um, from uh, plague death victims, from one of those plague pits from London, from a place called East Smithfield in London, Securely dated remains, because that's the other issue, of course, if you find Yersinia pestis in a skeleton, how do you know that the skeleton is actually from the period of the Black Death? These were securely dated, and they basically captured, they used a capture technique where they used modern Yersinia pestis sequences to fish out the ancient sequences and then sequence them. And they confirmed this earlier finding that the genome of the Black Death Yersinia pestis sat right at of the origin of all known contemporary sequences, the reconstructed origin of those. Now, what they inferred from that, they, they made uh, two, two kind of big inferences. I mean, they, they, there were lots of other things. It's worth reading the paper. They found some uh, bits of variation, like the earlier paper. They found that it wasn't, it wasn't just one uh, identical genome in all cases, it's that there was a bit of variation, and even in certain samples, there were polymorphisms. But the Two key findings that they, they made were, one is that, so if this is the same Yersinia pestis that we see today, there is no obvious kind of magical explanation as to why the Black Death occurred on the basis of bacteriology. Why, why did Yersinia pestis then do this when it doesn't do this kind of thing now? It looks as if the genome was the same, and so it must be other factors, it must be the, the ecology, the history, the social factors that accounted for the dramatic spread, rather than it being a super hot clone of Yersinia pestis back then. That was one assumption that they've made. The other assumption that they've made is that actually if, if, if what we see in the Black Death looks like the ancestor of all current plague, it suggests that the Black Death was the origin of modern of plague in humans. It was the first time 
that Yersinia pestis came into the human population and had a dramatic impact. And they actually made a quite a provocative case uh, point at the end of their paper to say that actually this means that the Justinian plague in the 6th and 7th century, for which there is some evidence from PCR that Yersinia pestis caused it, they say, well, maybe we have to rethink that. Now, this is the first plague. What went before, who knows what it was. Um, so that's, that's quite controversial. So here's their um, phylogenetic tree here. So they basically, the, 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 these are the two big branches that we mentioned earlier. This smudge of pink here is what they reconstructed from their ancestor, from their ancient DNA. They found a few snips there, but they found what they found there in those ancient DNA very, very close to the most recent common ancestor of all known contemporary uh, Yersinia pestis. And this was based, they looked at, there were, there were 1,694 variant positions known in the Yersinia pestis genome. So they weren't just basing this on a handful of positions. They were actually able to look, to look at a very large data set here and come up with this conclusion. And, and here is a, a, a kind of a, an, another kind of phylogenetic tree that they've drawn here. And uh, this is where they make the point that basically that pink line there is the black death, that, uh, is black death. Justinian plague predates, they, they, what they did here was they actually tried to work out a chronology and work out when these different um, uh, lineages diverged and they came up with a very tight chronology which said that basically that branch there was sometime between 1282 and 1343 and then uh, the Black Death follows, you know, 1311 to 47. They're very tight, excluding the Justinian plague. So that was, you know, so actually, the, you know, there's no clear answer to what's going on here. Do we just, can, does that mean that all the previous literature on just Justinian plague is, is flawed or, or was? Perhaps there was a second, completely separate Yersinia pestis introduction to human uh, populations back then which died out and left no progeny among current Yersinia pestis. We don't really know the answer to that. So I've um, taken you through infection history, genomic epidemiology, cholera, leprosy, plague, given you just one example of pathogen evolution, how we can actually we can reconstruct, in, to some degree at least, the biological changes that go on in evolution of pathogens. And I think you know, it's absolutely astonishing that we've actually, in, in, in recent years, moved to the stage where we can actually look at the genome sequences of these um, uh, hundreds of years old pathogens, pathogens that have had an uh, absolutely dramatic effect on human populations, and now we can actually glimpse them on our computers kind of face to face. I think that is actually quite a, a remarkable finding. And, and this is just the beginning. One thing I have, I, I've stuck to bacteria. Uh, if you're interested, there, there, there's uh, more of this kind of stuff going on with a more contemporary flavour in the terms of the, you may have heard that the 1918 flu virus genome was, was recovered a few years ago. Um, and in fact, in that case, they not only recovered the genome, but they've reconstructed the strain. Because with viruses, it's relatively easy to rebuild the genome and then to make a new strain. And they've, so this is it actually not, not, it really is waking the dead. I haven't had time to go into that because, I'm, as I say, I'm, hard to know what to, to cover in the time available. Um, as I mentioned, the slide cast this will go onto YouTube very soon, so if you've missed any points and want to go back over it, or those of you who are not here and watching this on Dave, you'll be able to watch it on YouTube sort of thing. And then uh, I was on In Our Time uh, with Melvin Bragg last year on the Radio 4 programme where we discussed the origins of outbreaks. Uh, there's a blog post there where I sort of put a detailed commentary on the points I made, and it also contains a link to that if you want to listen to the Radio 4 programme. Okay, that's me finished. Thank you. I